morning, everybody. We're glad to have all of you join us. We have quite a few people on. I know that some of these people have multiple people listening on their end of the screen. We're going to go over some of the basics of what the SPC is tonight, how it works. Um, we're going to talk about the different pieces that are pertinent to right now as far as registrations, getting those calves to us. Any questions you might have, you feel, feel free to either post those in the questions or the chat or raise your hand and we'll try and get those questions addressed as soon as we can. And then we're going to talk about the assignments and the webinars towards the end because there's some changes there for those of you that have participated previously. So with that, I'm going to let Chip take over and talk about some of the initial stuff. Hello all, this is Chip Kemp. I look forward to getting to know the new ones and reconnect with those of you who've participated in the past. We're going to jump right in and see if we can lay the groundwork for this year's steer profitability competition. So uh, again, always want to think about why are you in this deal? Well, what's in it for you and, and, and what's the driving force? And the thing that I would tell some of you who've been on uh, or in the program in previous years, and I think if I unmuted you and allow you to talk, I think many of those juniors could say hey they probably know more about cattle feeding than some of the commercial producers who live right down the road from them and have been raising cattle for an awful long time our hope is at the end of this um you're going to have distinctly more experience and you're going to have that opportunity to be a bit of a leader in your local community in your school in your 4-h club at ffa uh, helping folks understand the feedlot sector, some of the strengths and opportunities and challenges, along with the packing sector as well. And so you're going to be one of the people out front, and that's important, clearly from us as a motivator, but hopefully for you and your family as well. So our goal here is to help you think about how cattle feeding fits into the business at large, but also how it might fit into your own family's business. Again, it, it, it works well um, as a diversification play for a lot of producers. It isn't for everybody. And I think you'll probably come to recognize that. So some specific aims to make it very, very granular, very clear. We want to help you identify those areas of specific profit or loss associated with a, a steer or a group of steers that are on feed help you identify to the extent that we can, what might have caused those to happen, those, those profits or loss. We're gonna learn from a lot of experts who bring um, intellect and wisdom to the table from a variety of aspects around cattle feeding and around this portion of the beef business. You're gonna get feedback. And then of course, the C in SBC is competition. So you're gonna get the privilege to compare how your steer steers those to the others that are involved. So we recognize the competition part and we embrace that. But at the same time, I'd hope you think of this more as a learning opportunity, more as an internship, if you will, as opposed to a competition. We'll enjoy the competition part at the end. It'll be um, fun little banter and we can uh, challenge each other because of that going forward, who gets um, props this year but the biggest thing is we can all win if we're taking the time to learn and ask those tough questions. Some other specifics. Steers come to the feed yard early in November. You might say, well, I'd like more clarity on that. Specifically, when will they come in November? I don't know. And the reason I don't know and we can't know at this point is until all the juniors have listed the steers they're gonna deliver, and we have the time to sit down and look at the travel schedule and the logistics associated with those cattle. We can't identify that specifically just yet. We will here in the coming weeks, but for now know that in the first week to 10 days of November, we hope to have those cattle in the yard. And after that, they'll receive, uh, or receive a receiving ration or they'll be eating a receiving ration, which is a, a high forage ration to kind of get their gut right. That travel will shake them up just a little bit and get them off feed just a hair in some cases. And so we wanna make sure they're comfortable. Your cattle have the unique privilege of being fed on systems that are designed 
to measure everything about their intake and their appetite. The, our particular version that we'll use at the University of Missouri are manufactured by an app called GrowSafe, and we'll learn lots about those systems uh, as this unfolds. And then at the end, uh, your cattle, they'll be fed from November till probably somewhere late spring, early summer, at which time they'll be harvested. Here are some pretty important things that we want to throw at you. We strongly suggest you adhere to these. On occasion, we'll allow folks, if, if they're a little limited in terms of numbers, to fall a little bit outside of these, but recognize. You see that suggested birth date range and the weight range as well that's listed a few lines down. On occasion, we'll get cattle outside of that, but recognize when you do, if you come and your cattle are a light heavier, and you might think that's going to give you an advantage in the competition. I can assure you the data has shown year in and year out there's not a clear cut connection between entry rate weight and the, the in profitability or competition. There are a whole bunch of factors between the, the start and the end to dictate that. But what I can tell you is if you send in calves that are quite heavy, meaning let's say you have a steer's weighing 850 when he gets here, and that happens and we'll accept them, you're at a greater risk of getting a discount on the heavyweight side at the end of this and there's just not a lot that we can do about that because we need to ship these cattle as groups we don't get to send that one calf when he is ready the same thing if you send a calf who's a may baby weighing low fours if 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 we've had a conversation about it and you're still adamant about it we might take the calf recognize he's certainly at a distinct disadvantage and might end up getting shipped before his ideal endpoint because we're just limited a little bit so we encourage these things strongly. You need to have any calves you would send to this endeavor weaned here by the end of this week. And castration needs to be tended to prior to that time. We don't take cattle with horns. So if they're not naturally pulled, they need to be dehorned very quickly to make sure that uh, for their own health and welfare and for the safety of the other calves in the pens. It just minimizes problems and it gets more money on the backside of this project. So steer profitability competition is very clearly not a carcass contest. Those of you who've participated in the past know carcass value is clearly a huge determinant of how much profitability there's going to be. But while there are many carcass contests, you might have one in a local community or maybe following a county fair or maybe even after a state fair. And those are good endeavors. There's a lot to be learned from that. But if I just go and look at a carcass on a given day, that doesn't tell me anything about the dollars associated to getting it to that point. And so carcass valuation is a piece of the puzzle. It's not the only puzzle. Um, feedlot performance is clearly a part of it. Also, there's a slight update to the second bullet point. Historically, since the beginning of the SBC, we've used the Nebraska Weekly Report as the incoming valuation, meaning we have to put dollars and cents on your calves when they come here to have a handle on the worth of those calves. We've recognized that quite possibly for many of us, that's a bit of an inflated value. And so this year we're gonna try something slightly different and we're going to still base it off the Nebraska Weekly Report, but we're going to pull 25 cents a pound off of that price. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't change anything. It just shifts dollars up or down. So if there's a parent listening in the background, this is um, merely shifting uh, profit a little higher or maybe mitigating some loss or something like that. Um, it, it doesn't really move real dollars. This is for the education component because there's always an opportunity cost associated with a feeder steer. Whether for this competition or if you're selling a group of 60 calves at home, you could sell those steers as opposed to feed them. It's an economic decision to feed them. So for this competition, we need to add value. And so it'll be recognized as an expense in, in your reports, though you'll never actually pay any dollars. Clearly you already own the calf. So because it's profitability, essentially 
this contest is quite simple. From the time the calves get to the yard, we'll take care of the initial shipping cost. We'll take the initial val valuation of your calf with that Nebraska report multiplied by the weight of the calf. And then all the expenses associated, just like any other cattle feeder, that's yardage. We'll explain more what some of these terminologies mean in the near future, but that's essentially your monthly rent for that animal being there, um, the feed cost, any health, any uh, other services that might be rendered. But predominantly, it's, it's feed, yardage, and health. All those expenses are accrued from the day they arrive till the day they get to the plant, including shipping costs to the plant, including your beef checkoff, those sort of things. We add those expenses up. The packer is going to pay you a certain amount based on carcass value. And you subtract those two. So the final steer profitability competition overall uh, profit basis is that final carcass valuation, the amount the packer gives you in form of a check, and they will, minus your expenses. So along the way, you have some obligations and some responsibilities. First, your animal needs to be on file with us. If that's not done, and you don't even know what I'm talking about, that's okay, don't panic. At the very end of this, you're gonna see an email for Bailey Abel, and if you have any questions on that, you're gonna reach out to her very soon, well, like tomorrow, and say, hey, let's start talking about getting my animals on file. Regardless of breed type, we need to get that done. Your second obligation and responsibility, you and your family are going to aid us into that initial logistics of hauling those cattle the first time. Now, that might mean we come to your place, or it might mean that you and some locals collect cattle at one of your neighbor's places, or it may mean that you have to meet me part way. We'll figure that out down the road, but um, we very likely will need some help in that initial hauling to the feed yard in the center part of the state of Missouri. A very serious obligation. You have to pay your monthly bill. It's not a choice, it's not an opportunity. You will pay your monthly bill. And for those of you or maybe family members in the background who have fed cattle in the past in a commercial setting, you might know that frequently in a traditional feed yard, we might accrue those bills to the very end, meaning you don't have to settle up on your bill until those cattle are harvested. And that's a very acceptable manner of handling expenses in, in a commercial feeding setting. However, a large portion of what we're doing here is education. That's our primary mission and focus. And so we think one of the ways to help you keep tabs on your own calf and experience what it really means for that calf to be in that yard that month is to see that monthly bill and need to tend to that, that expense. And again, um, Ms. Bailey will help you work through that process when it comes time. Thank Discount you, this piece, say that again. I just wanna cut in real quick because I know that one thing that we get questions about a lot um, and just to clear up for anyone wondering. So with that monthly bill, um, your entry fee will be included in that first monthly bill, but we will not send that monthly bill out until we get December's data. So don't be expecting as soon as you register to see a bill for those entry fees or for, for you to be getting a bill the, the first week of November when those calves come. We make sure those calves make it there all safe and sound and we make sure they get on feed and we get that first month under their belt and then you will get that first monthly bill. Good point. Thank you for thank you for that. That's that's a worthy addition. The part there on the participate in the monthly webinars, ignore that because I forgot to remove it because uh, Ms. Abel's going to talk to you about some updates on that in a few minutes. So just ignore all of that just because. Your cap data, once the first round of data comes in, that too won't happen until early December will be kept updated on the SBC website. And most of you probably already know how to find that. Some other important information. 
just like anybody who's retaining ownership in a feed yard, you maintain ownership. These cattle are yours all the way up to the time that they get to the packing plant. However, also like in a traditional setting, you forfeit management and possession of those calves once they come here, meaning that other folks are going to make the decision on your behalf. Essentially, you're paying professionals, in this case, the manager at the University of Missouri Beef Teaching and Research Center, you're paying those professionals to manage these decisions for you. So you still own the calves, they make the decision. Also, important information, all steers will have DNA collected. So if you were thinking, well, do I need to get some DNA on file? Well, if you've already pulled that, and some of you based on your operations very likely have already done that, in which case that's wonderful. But if you haven't, no worries. We will tend to that, uh, no concerns for you uh, once they get to the feed jar. Your calves are to come to us doubly vaccinated. It's pretty clear in the upfront rules that you've probably seen in the publications or online. But we wanna be as safe as possible. We've been remarkably blessed through the years to keep health concerns to a minimum. That's neither by an act, that's not by accident. And frankly, it's probably not inevitable that it'll always be that way. There'll probably be a day when we have something flare up maybe because some weather hit us wrong or something of that nature. But you're going to bring them to us doubly, doubly vaccinated. We're going to hit them one more time just to make sure. Also, this probably goes without saying, but I want to make sure everybody understands. You own those calves, but by function that you forfeited management decisions, those cattle will not be coming back to you. It is a terminal contest, and those animals will be harvested at the discretion of feed yard management. Again, nutrition, implant strategies, those things also at the discretion of feed yard management. I can tell you we've used implants consistently through this program. We monitor that decision every year. Potentially there are years we may choose to not do that. As a rule, um, that's gonna be leave, leaving a little bit of performance and hence a little bit of money on the table. So you and your family might have particular takes on that. But in the feed yard, we will leave that up to the feed yard manager. And again, they'll be harvested when management feels that they are ready, ready and uh, in a position to maximize their profitability. You should know feed yard management makes these, these decisions in serious consultation with ASA staff. Uh, we're informed of all these decisions, but ultimately we, we leave and rely on their their expertise. Ms. Abel, we'll talk to you a little bit about the, web, uh, the, the way the assignments are going to adjust this year, but just as a reminder, and I want to be remarkably clear on this, you own these cattle. You will, regardless, if you don't participate in another event, you will get paid for your steer because it's your steer. But if you do not participate in the assignment format, that is presented to you, or if you don't pay your bills, you will be removed from the competition and your data will be blocked. So you will never get to see that data. So I'm going to assume most of you are here for the educational aspect and the competition. That's fun part two. Um, not just for the privilege of shipping a steer off and getting a check back in a number of months. And so make sure you're keeping up with your assignments and keeping your bill paid. Payments will not be at the very end of this contest, will not be distributed until all bills are paid. And as Ms. Abel already mentioned, there is an entry fee. And you've probably seen that on the promotional material that'll be billed in that first month. And we have to be clear on this. Uh, there is risk when you do these sort of things. It is distinctly possible that an animal can get hurt, that an animal might even experience death in an untimely and in an in early fashion that can't be avoided. We've been terribly blessed through the years of the SBC. Um, I, I can recall one animal that was injured severely that was ultimately euthanized uh, and, and another that was realized a little bit early as well. 
but those are the only two in all the years we've been doing this that I can recall, but it very well could happen this year and you need to be aware of that. And there is no insurance to cover those situations. We do our best to help if we can, but no guarantees on those things. We just want to be upfront. Real quick to the, to the logistics and travel component. You have to have your health papers ready when those animals are to be picked up. Uh, again, those details will be discussed in the future. Uh, likely me, uh, likely myself will be the one calling you and your parents, discussing very specific plans of attack on that. Just remember that you will need a vet to handle those papers. So plan ahead, maybe not so far ahead if you live in a state where health papers are limited uh, in their length of value. But at this point, most of you could probably go ahead and call the vet and I would think would be okay with those health papers. But I defer to your vet uh, on their expertise on that. We'll screen those calves and, and if we show up with a trailer and there's a calf who's just obviously unhealthy or unthrifty in some fashion, then we will reject that steer. We retain that right. I will tell you, we've never had to exercise that right, but we check every calf before it gets on the trailer and it, it's been good for our students. We've not had to worry about calves that got here and just were chronics. And so just recognize, spring, don't, don't bring us your misfits because it might bite you when you get to haul that one home. At this point, I've already said, we'll organize a route. Have no clue what that is just yet. We do attempt for participants, for junior participants, to get minimally within 250 miles of their home place. And I would say, oh, with only a few exceptions, we've gotten much, much closer than that. There have been a few exceptions that came from farther out of the way places. It took a little more distance and we do a little more work, but most of the time we'll get quite a little bit closer than 250 by a lot. But if we do have a regional collection point, it's going to be you and your family's responsibility to get them there. Again, early November, don't know when. With that, I see there's a question. If implants are used, Ella asked that question. If implants are used, how do we compare genetics? Well, that's a great question. And I would love to answer it and, and can. But since we have a guest on here, I'm going to ask Dr. Atkins, did you hear that question? Uh-oh, Dr. Atkins might have had to leave us. Fair enough, Ella. I'll go ahead and answer the question. Implants in this case are going to be an environmental impact and provided all the animals in this contemporary group that's what we'll call this group if you're familiar with genetics terminology. If not, you'll hear more about that term in the future. As long as the environmental impact is fairly equitable across the contemporary group, we can parse that out or we can tease out the difference between those environmental factors and genetics. Now, the concern would be, yes, if some animals were implanted and others were not within this group, it would make it essentially impossible to know, was it genetics or the result of those hormonal treatments that were doing certain things from a growth standpoint. But since we're treating them the same, we can tease that out. And I think that's such an excellent question. I'll probably put that on the docket for one of our future live webinars if it's not covered in another, another place because it's a, a fairly mature question and I appreciate that on our first webinar. With that, Ms. Abel, yep. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chip. So for our assignments, newsletter, webinars, we wanted to address this because some of you that are on have participated with us before and some of you are brand new and might want to know how this works. So what we will do is Previously, as you might have saw on Chip's slide, is we had a once a month live webinar. And it got to be, as this program grew, some kids struggled to meet those webinars every month for varieties of reasons and other activities. And 
other um, something else that we had frequently come across is that we would have um, months that tended themselves either more towards our younger participants or our older participants. And so we wanted to kind of clear that out and make it easier across the board. So Chip, I'll go ahead and let you flip into the next slide. Oh, well, I apologize. I'm going to talk about the newsletter quick. Then we'll jump back to the webinar on the assignment. With the newsletter, so you all will get a brief email newsletter. It's nothing extravagant, nothing that's overly strenuous for you all to take a look at once a month and we'll likely send those out around billing time this year and so you'll see that'll have any important dates any um, interesting articles that we've come across it'll maybe give a brief intro or topic discussion on what um, the webinar for that month would be if you follow the traditional timeline and we'll also give participant introductions so these newsletters just go out to you participants and we'll ask for a brief intro from each of you just so that your fellow participants can see you since this is obviously not an in-person event and get to know a bit more about you. So with the webinar and the assignment, as I said, it's gonna operate a bit differently. So we are going to make this educational portion of the SPC a bit more self-led. You all are going to get to work through this at your own pace um, within reason. We have parameters set where you, you have a bit of time on either side. You can't go too short, and you can't stretch them too long. But we want you to be able to go through these webinars. There's six of them set up in module format. And for those of you who have already registered, you should have seen an email come across that was your welcome email. So that will be kind of the basic format for what you're going to see from us this year. You're going to get an email um, with each of these modules that discusses your video options. And you're gonna get to pick. We're going to work really hard to make sure that each age group has at least two video options. Like I said, that allows us to gear things more specifically for the different ages. And then once you select that video option, then you're gonna watch that whole video. And those will typically be between 45 minutes and an hour. Obviously, some topics may range from that just a touch, but that's where we really try to keep things at. And then you're going to follow up with just a quick quiz, nothing strenuous or difficult, couple questions. And that quiz will be what leads to an email and allows you to see your assignment. So you will select the video that you want, and there'll be one assignment option specifically geared to that video topic. Once you submit that assignment, you'll receive your score. That will be live graded. That won't be an automatic grade. We'll still grade those in person, just like we have every other year with the assignment. So you'll receive that grade and that'll be the, the triggering point for you all to receive your next module. So that means that you can work through these once a month if you prefer, you like that setup and that works well for you. Or if you know that there's a month that's busier for you, you're welcome to work ahead and move a little bit quicker through those. This will all be done via email. So what that means is that each participant, so each individual junior member, will be required to have an email to utilize. So we understand that a lot of these kids, you'll, you will want stuff going through parent or guardian email. And so we will gladly include any guardian email on billing, important updates, et cetera, et cetera. But each participant will have to have an individual email so that we can keep track of them through the system. They're welcome to use a school email, um, personal email, whatever works best for you, separate parents, however that works. Um, webinars and the assignments, as Chip said, are absolutely required along with the billing. Those are all geared to be once a month. Again, you can flex the webinar assignments as you need to be, but those have to be completed. Um, there will be points where you get reminder emails and then we will personally step in if we need to as well. Those have to be completed on time or we will lock down that data. Awards will be given to the highest grade in the competition. So just as your cows are competing, so are you all. In each of your categories, or your age groups and overall, you all will be competing for awards for the top three in each of those sections. 
And then additionally, because we are doing this as a self-paced model, we still want to make sure we have plenty of interaction with you all and a chance to answer questions um, and, and still maintain as much face-to-face -face as we can in a completely virtual setting like this. So we will have two to three, kind of depending on how everything works out, but two to three live webinars. Those will be scheduled throughout the year, and we'll get to those a little closer to you, and no need to worry about those specific dates right now. Once we get those calves in, we'll talk through some of those dates. That'll be to discuss data, how those calves did coming in, how those calves did when they go to the plant, and we'll also have a final SPC check-in with each participant. With that, um, typically those live webinars will record them, and if for some reason you absolutely cannot make the day that is set, we'll give you a little leeway. You'll have a few days to watch that, but you will still be required to watch them. So with that, Chip, is there? Yep. So this is our last slide. So as Chip mentioned earlier, this SPC at SimGene.com is your main email. This is the main contact that you will have. Um, you're obviously welcome to reach out to Chip or I as well, but that will be the main point of contact for you all. And any registration questions need to be directed there. And we will be happy to help you and get that sorted out as quickly as possible and direct you to where we need to go next. Is there anything I forgot in there, Chip? I don't believe, Bailey. I, I think the primary thing that I'd, I'd want the, the listeners to take away from this is we enjoy the heck out of this. We're going to feed some cattle. We're going to learn a lot. Because we are feeding cattle, these are live animals. Sometimes things will shift and morph around. Um, you know that. You know it from home. So recognize, on occasion, things have to um, modify a little bit from a schedule standpoint or from a feeding standpoint based on where we thought we'd be. I think you probably would expect those things to happen just based on what you're used to at home, what your family experiences. But no, this has been just a tremendous opportunity. The last few years have been great in that the educational experiences have really upped the ante as Bailey has taken the helm of this program. And it's it's been a, a tremendous opportunity to, to, to share this kind of insight from experts from all over the country will join us in, in, in some of these videos that uh, Bailey mentioned. And the live webinars in particular will be will certainly be highlights for us. Um, a, a question just popped through. Um, the question was, if, if there are kids that might have in, any sort of challenges to the, to the traditional learning environment or to the traditional manner of handling the, the assignments, uh, can we work with that? Absolutely. Uh, very clearly, we've had those things happen in the past. We relish the opportunity to work through that. So we have a fair amount of flexibility. We're, we're good to help a family solve those concerns. What I would suggest is uh, just take a few minutes and reach out to Bailey, talk through that, make sure she's on the same page so that there's no confusion. Let's head off some of any concerns that might pop up in the beginning. But absolutely, we want any and all folks to participate in this. And if they bring a fresh perspective because they learn a little different, that just makes the program better. And Chip, actually, that question brought up, as you were talking, I realized there was one thing that I forgot to mention that we frequently get asked. And since we have a lot of um, newcomers on with us tonight, I want to make sure I address it. So with those assignments, um, because it is web-based, it can be easy to think that those are all going to be the same and you're going to be expected to write a paper or whatnot. Um, that is not how these assignments are. It's not how they're going to be, at least as long as I'm involved. We've worked pretty hard the last couple of years to make sure that these assignments have a lot of variety to them um, and can be easily adaptable and can fit a number of different um, outlooks, perspectives, as well as experience. We try to welcome, we know that we have some participants that come to us with little to none experience with feedlots or even cattle sometimes. Um, and we have some that have been around their whole lives. 
And so we have a variety from, we might have a written report one month, but then we might have a, a science experiment that we ask you to document. Or we might ask you to make a um, food-based recipe or assignment. That's a, a frequent favorite. We might ask you to do a visual assignment, uh, make some graphics or draw for our younger participants. And we also really enjoy when we get video feedback. Um, for those members that either are younger and typing is not the best thing for them or that have different learning capabilities, we are open and encourage. We want you all to submit assignments that are the best product that you all can make. And so if that means that giving a report um, via speech on a video is the best way for you to do that, then we welcome that. We, we find it fun to mix things up when we're grading those. So I hope that answers that question a bit more and also anyone else that might have been wondering about that. It, one other thing, uh, a couple of other things. One thing I would strongly encourage all of you who are on here, because this program is designed to be so open armed, essentially anybody can participate if with fairly limited um, uh, effort and, and, and certainly fairly limited knowledge of their cattle provider, they're willing to overcome a, a handful of hurdles. And so I'd also encourage you to talk to the other folks in your 4-H club and in your FFA chapter. If there are other people who are serious about the beef business from your community or your family or your area who you think would, would, would benefit from something like this, even if they're from a different breed type than uh, maybe have typically been involved, that's okay. Every year we have folks who join for the first time because um, maybe their SAE project and FFA was beef oriented, but they just didn't, weren't going to have the opportunity to have this kind of experience. Good. Let's see if we can help them. If they don't have a calf directly, maybe you or another breeder of, a, uh, a, of some sort of seed stock nearby can help them or a commercial producer. So let, let's, let's try to help our friends and neighbors if we can because it, it makes us all smarter and better as we go forward. But another question did pop up, Bailey, from Blake. And the question is, do we have those regional meeting points set up yet? And sadly, absolutely not, unfortunately, because until we close the date for getting all the cattle in, which we won't do for a little bit yet, I just won't know where those collection points should be and every year we've done this, I don't even know anymore, six years or something like that. And every year they, they turn out to be completely different than previous years. And so um, I will do my best to let you know those things as quick as possible. And we'll talk um, extensively and we'll, we'll get that hammered out. We'll make it as painless as we can, but right now we just don't. So with that, I don't see any other questions. Do you have anything else? I don't have anything um, exciting. I just wanted to add on to that. To your last point, though, the more people you get in an area, the more likely you're getting to a close trailer. So talk to yeah. those uh, friends and relatives. The more calves in your area, the, the closer we can get. Yep, that, that is true. If you want the quickest way to ensure you don't have to drive very far is to make sure the trailer is going to be full when I come to see you. Good point. So. With that, if you have any questions when this is over, um, I'd encourage you to use that email. Yes, thank you very much. And I appreciate the staff that were on to help and all of the attendees. And we'll go ahead and we will get this recording out as quick as we can tomorrow and send that out. So if you all have anyone that you know that couldn't make it on tonight, I know there's a lot of stuff going on and some people couldn't be on with us this evening, feel free to share that with them. Thank you all very much.